If you're going to see answers to prayer, you're going to have to fight. You're going to have to be proactive. Spiritually impactful things do not come in this life without a battle. Have you noticed that? There's a war. You're normally going to have to endure a lot to get there. There has to be travail, brother and sister. your Bible this morning, would you turn to Daniel chapter 10? Daniel chapter 10, uh, we're going to start verse 1. Kyle's going to just read the word for us this morning. Daniel 10, 1 through 13. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belshazzar. And the thing was true, but the time appointed was long, and he understood the thing, and had understanding of the vision. In those days I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all, till three whole weeks were fulfilled. And in the four and twentieth day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is called Hiddekel, then I lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with the fine gold of Euphaz. His body also was like the barrel, and his face as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like in color to polish brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them, so that they fled to hide themselves. Therefore I was left alone, and saw this great vision, and there remained no strength in me, for my comeliness was turned in me into corruption, and I retained no strength. Yet heard I the voice of his words, and when I heard the voice of his words, then was I in a deep sleep on my face, and my face toward the ground. And behold, an hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. And we, when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for, the, from, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand, and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days, But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with with the kings of Persia. Thanks, Kyle. So I've called this message this morning, There is a struggle that comes with prayer, part four. There is a struggle that comes with prayer, part four. I hope as we're looking in depth at this important subject of prayer that Um, It is not sounding like prayer is an A to Z. Um, One of the difficulties about going into depth on a subject, it can seem like, oh, well, I'm, this is way above my head. That's one of the, that's one of the challenges, one of the difficulties about digging deep. Um, I hope that we're not given the impression that there's only a select few people in this church that have the right or the ability to pray to God and get answers to prayer. Um, Because that's not true. Prayer is for all of God's people, from the youngest in this place to the oldest. You can teach a child at a tender age to pray, and I believe they can get the ear of God even as a child. Um, In fact, I would say this, the devil fears the weakest of saints when they're upon their knees crying out to God. He hates that. Saying all that, the more we grow in Christ, the more our prayer life should develop and expand. The reason why prayer can be so difficult is because it is so potent. If you struggle with prayer, if you find an incredible resistance when it comes to the subject of prayer, please know there is a very valid reason. The devil hates it, and it is impactful. I don't think anyone in here this morning 
is an expert. I'm definitely not an expert on this subject. Um, it is an issue that we're always learning on, and it's a battle every time we truly engage in serious, effective prayer. Can you identify with that this morning? But if you're going to be effective and impactful when you pray, there are certain basics you're going to have to employ. We have looked at some of these over this past few weeks, and I just want to remind you of a few before we get into where we need to go this morning. Number one, it's crucial that you know who God is and what he is capable of if you want to be able to pray. Would you agree? Um, Number two, you're going to have to know his will, which is primarily revealed in his word and also applied and explained by the promptness of the Spirit of God. So you could be driving along in the car and the Spirit of God can just prompt you for someone or something out of the blue. Amen? So there needs to be not just an awareness of God's word, but also a sensitivity to his spirit. Um, Now, I'm not suggesting that you need to know the Bible from cover to cover, to know every promise, to know everything God has to say in prayer. None of us have a full revelation of that. Um, But you do need to know God's truth. Mm -hmm. Number three, you're going to have to surround your prayer in thanks, praise, and worship. We looked at that. Number four, you're going to have to believe God to answer the cry of your heart. We talked about that last week. Do you believe when you pray? Do you expect God to answer your prayers? Um, I just want to share this because this happened to me a few months ago. It, it was after I came back from Ireland and been over the time of the Huskers. But um, Brother Ron approached me um, after I come back and he had been praying for my finger. I don't know whether any of you remember, but... My finger was stubbed, or what do they call it in America? Jammed. jammed. My finger was jammed to the stage where I couldn't, I couldn't shake people's hands, and it was actually painful to me. So all I could do, and I thought it was, you know, I was starting to, it was starting to recover in Ireland, and then Ron got the, all the Huskers players lined up, and every one of them a big handshake of me, and like, ah, ah. but I come home, I was in agony, and honestly, but. Uh, it was a couple of weeks after I got home I was talking to Ron and he says um, is your hand not healed yet? and he was like pretty bold and confident on it and I'm like uh, no <laughs> no <laughs> he says it's still as sore as ever in fact it's probably as sore as it's been I, I mean Cameron can tell you I wouldn't even shake his hand I mean I'm like I, when people were shaking my hand I was so but Him saying that, Ron saying that, challenged me. I had been praying, but I was praying, but I wasn't expecting. And the Holy Ghost convicted me after Ron said that. I'm like, because Ron was expecting, because he's pretty confident, at least he he come across as expecting, (laughs) because he was bold, like, really? It's not, it's not, it's not healed yet? Like, really? So I apologized to the Lord and said, sorry. I said, do you know the next day God healed my hand? The next day. The next day. And it's been fine ever since. Now, has anybody ever had a jammed um, finger? Like, (coughs) would you agree? It doesn't go away easy or quickly. It's one of those things, in my experience, seems to linger and linger. And it just, and then it keeps getting. So I'm telling you, from personal experience, I'm still learning. And there's times where I pray, but I'm not praying, believing. Okay? So please please know as we're covering this subject that this preacher is on a learning curve just like you. But, and I want you to hear me really carefully this morning. As important as it is to have a correct revelation of the character of God, as important as it is to be familiar with God's promises and to recognize the promptness of the Spirit, as important as it is knowing that prayer is not just asking God for things, but it involves thanks, praise, and worship, as important as it is to exercise faith and not doubt in your petitions, 
If you are not prepared to be patient, be disciplined, and travail in your prayers, you are not going to see the realization of your prayers. I want to look this morning at prevailing prayer. If you're going to see answers to prayer, you're going to have to fight. You're going to have to be proactive. Spiritually impactful things do not come in this life without a battle. Have you noticed that? There's a war. You're normally going to have to endure a lot to get there. There has to be travail, brother and sister. There has to be persistence. If you're prone to get discouraged, if you're easily knocked off course, if you give up quickly, if you're impatient, then you're going to struggle with the subject of prayer. There's a lot of people, they pray once and God doesn't answer, and then they end up pointing the finger at God. Well, I prayed this, and why did he not do it? They don't understand this subject of prayer. They don't understand all these elements that we're talking about this morning. Hebrews 10, 36 tells us, For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. Now, patience isn't always our strongest point. I don't know about you, but patience is one of my big struggles in life. Um, There's a saying, something like, patience is a quality not found in a man, but rarely found in a woman. I don't know whether it's true or not. That's an Irish statement. And (laughs) I don't know about you, we're impatient creatures. Be honest this morning. God's here this morning. Who is impatient in this house? Okay. Okay, so I don't feel too bad then. Okay. (laughs) Patience, by the way, patience is basically the ability to wait or continue doing something despite difficulties or delay without complaining, getting upset, or giving up. That's patience. James 1, 3 says, The trying of your faith worketh patience. Are you been tried this morning? Are you been stretched out this morning? Are you? Well, the Bible says the trying of your faith worketh patience. And again, worketh is ongoing. Maybe God's just working in you at the moment. He's trying to bring that quality out. He's trying to bring that to the fore. Patience, by the way, is a virtue. It is listed by Paul in Galatians 5 um, as among the fruit of the Spirit. I think it's fair to say that none of us like waiting on answers to prayer. That takes real spiritual discipline, it takes trust, and it takes persistence. Would you agree? I would say if there's a subject we all struggle with is waiting on God. So you bring a sincere prayer before him. And with all your heart, and you can even have faith in your heart to believe, I know he's going to answer this. And a week later, a month later, a year later, 10 years later, it's not answered. Is that easy? So there's nothing easy about this subject that we're talking about this morning. Uh, Well-known Christian writer Oswell Chambers puts it well. Patience is more than endurance. A saint's life is in the hands of God like a bow, an arrow in the hands of an archer. God is aiming at something the saint cannot see. And he stretches and strains. And every now and again the saint says, I cannot stand anymore. God does not heed. He goes on stretching till his purpose is in sight. Then he lets fly. Uh, Oswald Chambers says this, Trust yourself in God's hands. Maintain your relationship to Jesus Christ by the patience of faith. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Amen. Isaiah 40 verse 31 says, They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Amen. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. 
They that wait upon the Lord. They that wait upon the Lord. When you are heavenly or spiritually minded, you have time to wait. You're not in a rush because God has things to do with you and others in the process. But if you're in the flesh, I can tell you what, you're going to be ultra impatient and you're going to let a lot of stuff build up if you're in the flesh. Does that make sense? Have a look at the lives of those people around you who refuse to wait on God and are continually rushing in and making rash fleshly decisions. Have a look at their lives. How does it look? Their life's a mess. They're all over the place. One day they're going north, the next day south. One minute it's east, the next minute it's west. Amen? Amen. That's the flesh. The flesh is so destructive, so impulsive, so untrustworthy, it's, it's horrible. The flesh does not like to wait. People like this don't truly trust God because they do not intimately know Him. They don't know how to stand upon His promises because they do not function by faith. They're rather driven by feelings or emotions or their own stinking thinking. I'm telling you what, when you get into the place of prayer, if you're bringing your emotions and feelings and your stinking thinking into it, it's not going to be pretty what comes out of your mouth. It's not going to be trustworthy. Would you agree? So carnal people try and manipulate God in the same way they manipulate others around them. The only thing is, you can't manipulate God. And they try and put God on a guilt trip. And Oh, I've been asking you for 133 years and you haven't done this, God. As if they're going to put God on a guilt trip. What do you think? How do you think that manipulative prayer works? Huh? His ears are closed to prayers like that. If you think that you can put God and point the finger at God and say, Lord, you know, I've done this and you're not doing this. God doesn't do anything wrong. So we cannot in any way on this journey, even if we don't understand it, even if it's hurting us, we have no authority to point the finger at him and say, it's your fault. No, most of the time we say that, it's our fault. Not somebody else's, but our fault. Zechariah 7.13 shows this. It says this, And he, God, cried, and they would not hear. So they cried, and I would not hear, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, wise Christians know that God will do the right thing in the right way at the right time. Would you agree? Can I say that once more? Wise Christians know that God will do the right thing in the right way at the right time. Hebrews 6.12 says, Be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith, with patience, inherit the promises. Patience is a quality that is elevated in this book, but patience also involves travail. I'm going to get to that now. Last week we talked about the need for faith when it comes to prayer. Well, patience goes hand in hand with faith. Got Questions Ministries Online says on their website, I think this is Curtis's favorite uh, website. <laughs> I'm only joking, Curtis. <laughs> In the Bible, patience is persevering toward a goal, enduring trials or expectantly waiting for a promise to be fulfilled. In the Bible, patience is persevering toward a goal, enduring trials, or expectantly waiting for a promise to be fulfilled. Sometimes you have to fight for a blessing. <laughs> Listen, it is the heart of the believer to want to be blessed. Amen? Who wants to be blessed this morning? Amen? Well, sometimes you have to fight for it. Hosea 12 ver verse 4 says of Jacob in the Old Testament, Yes, 
he had power over the angel and prevailed. He went and made supplication unto him. And he found him in Bethel. And there he spoke with us. Jacob had to struggle to fight with the Lord to get an answer. The word prevail here, by the way, means to overcome, to be a victor, to endure, to have power, and to be able. It literally means to be able to gain, be able to accomplish, be able to endure, be able to reach. That's the sense of the original Hebrew word. By the way, does this describe your approach to prayer? Is this your approach to prayer? Pastor John Barros explains it like this. Prevailing prayer is prayer that has power or influence with God. It is a type of prayer that is capable of producing results. Prayer that accomplishes something. And to prevail in prayer means to endure until you have prayed through to an answer. Listen to me real careful. Scripture proves that there normally has to be travail before you prevail. Or I'll put that differently. Travailing prayer is prevailing prayer. Okay? The, now, First Thessalonians 5.17 says, Pray without ceasing. Ephesians 6.18 says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Romans 12.12 12 says, Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant or steadfast in prayer. Now I want you to notice here that it says that you must be instant in prayer. But it doesn't say that you will get instant answers to prayer. Okay, big difference. So you have to be instant in prayer. So when you feel the unction, when you feel that prayer being led upon your heart, you should be instant, steadfast. When you start to pray that prayer, you should be steadfast. Does that make sense? Okay. So many of us, when we think of travail, what do we normally think about? Childbirth. Okay. Well, this is what Jesus said in John 16, verses 21 through 22. A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow, because her hour is not come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish. For joy that a man is born into the world. And ye now therefore have sorrow. But I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. You know, it is a natural fact. The closer it comes to something being birthed, the more travail is involved. Is that not right, mamas? The closer it gets, the more travail starts to increase and increase. Casey, okay, things start to increase, increase, and increase, and increase, and increase until something happens. Something miraculous happens. A baby is born into this world. You know, I honestly, kind of one of the greatest things that's ever happened to me to be present at the birth of all three of my kids. Um, as a man, obviously, we don't experience travail. I mean, we can say we understand, you know, I, I get it. It seems like it's tough, but we don't get it. We really don't get it. We can hold your hand and we can do whatever, but honestly, we don't have to go through the travail. But <clears throat> God uses travail, the woman in travail, as an example when it comes to prayer. Um, you know, he, Jesus spiritualizes this in regard to endurance and holding on in regard to what God has promised you. Um, we need to be aware, and I want you to hear this because this might help you this morning. There are certain things we have to go through to get to where we're going. There are certain things we have to go to to enable certain things to happen. There are certain things we have to go through to produce in us what God needs. 
So that travail is all part of a process that's going to produce something. Life. Life. By the way, the greatest example of travailing and prevailing prayer was Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. How did that go for him? Luke twenty-two forty-four. listen to this. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Can you imagine what that was like? Here is the master prayer warrior. Here is the perfect example. And look what he's gone through in prayer for you and me. I believe that that in Gethsemane, he was seeing the enormity of the task, seeing the enormity of your sin and my sin. And he was about to be acquainted with every single dirty, vile sin that you've ever done. Every dirty, vile thing stinking sin that I've done every think of the thoughts that go through your head in a week Mm. think of the feelings that go through your heart in the course of a week Mm. think of the words that you say in the course of a week Mm -hmm. think of the actions that you do in the course of a week Mm -hmm. the sins think of the sins of commission think of the sins of omission and he in Gethsemane is travailing travailing over you and me you know what? He didn't give up. He kept going. This is extreme travail. And by the way, he knew, according to John 18, 4, he knew all that he was going, that was going to happen to him. He knew that he was going to be betrayed by one of his own. He knew that. He was about to be betrayed by Judas Iscariot. He knew the wicked schemes of the religious that were about to hit him. He knew he was going to be brought before a kangaroo court and judged unfairly. He knew he was going to be mocked and scoffed, rejected and abused. He knew he was going to have his back scourged. He knew he was going to be humiliated in agony on a cross. And here he is, interceding for you and me, in travail. I believe there's a lesson here especially if you're going through the battle this morning. You could be in a real dark battle. You could be going through your Gethsemane this morning. It could be rough. It could be tough. It could be like, what's going on here? Uh, But I'm telling you, on the authority of God's word, he will keep his word. If we faint not. Do you have a loved one this morning? that's lost or backslidden, that you're grieving over, that you're travailing for? Is there someone in your family? Is there a friend? Is there a workmate? That it just seems like the more that you share the truth with them, the worse they're getting or the further it's getting away? Well, you need to travail. You need to fight. You need to persist. You need to be patient. Because that is an integral part of intercessory prayer. There's a very powerful verse in Isaiah 66, 8. And this is what it says. For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. So what's the purpose here of travail? Travail produces spiritual births. By the way, Christians are spiritually referred in the word of God as Zion. So when you see Zion here, you're talking about God's people. As we travail, things are birthed in the Spirit. Many souls become born again through someone's travail. And please hear me before you think that I'm going over a line. Prayer is us partnering with God. Okay? So it's not not us thinking up a good idea and then God standing attention and going, yes, sir. Okay? We've talked about praying in the will of God. But if you're praying God's heart, okay? And as you're obedient to God's heart, then guess what? That prayer will be answered in his time. Does that make sense? Let me give you other scripture. Psalm 126, 5 through 6 gives us an amazing promise here if we take him at his word. 
Psalm 126, 5. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bringing precious seed, shall doubtless, doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. I, it was a missionary friend of mine that emphasized the word doubtless there. He says, Paul, do you see the word doubtless? He says, do you realize what God's saying there? If you do this, he will do this. There's no doubt about it. He will keep his word. Isn't that lovely, the word doubtless in there? He shall doubtless. I'm telling you what, God will keep his word. He will keep his side of the bargain. I know at the moment it may look impossible. But we serve a God who does the impossible. So that's where we have to just align with him and say, Lord, you've said it, that's enough for me. George Muller is classed as one of the great spiritual giants ever to live. And don't want to uh, tell his story this morning. I don't have time to tell his story. Um, but you know that he had an orphanage. And many times, many, many times, there was nothing there to feed the children until they prayed. And they would actually, by faith, knowing there was no food in the kitchen, they would get all the kids and all their big long tables, they would get them all into the canteen, and Muller would say, we're going to thank the Lord for his provision. And he said many times, as they were praying, he said the food trucks would just pull up. Donations, people giving the orphanage what they needed. They were thanking him, even though there was nothing in the kitchen. That's, that's real faith. That's real travail, would you agree? Thank you, Lord, for your provision. That's not presumptuous. That's somebody who's in touch with the Lord. Well, guess what he says on this subject? On praying for the unsaved. I hope in God. I pray on. And look yet for the answer. They are not converted yet, but they will be. (laughs) Can I share that once more? So this is his attitude to praying for the ungodly that God's led on his heart. I hope in God, I pray on, and look yet for the answer. They are not converted yet, but they will be. Is that boldness? Is that your attitude as you pray for your loved ones? You know, I don't cry easy. I'm, I'm not somebody to get just emotional um, real easy. Um, I definitely don't cry at movies, okay? I'm like, they're just actors. Like, why is everybody weeping over this here? And they're just, they're pretending. They're not, you know. So, but I, I, don't, I don't cry easy. Um, probably 15 years as a police officer beat that out of me. But I can tell you what. There's been several circumstances in this life that I have wept over the souls of people I know. Key people. And it just, one of those times was in front of the computer in Ireland. It just come over me, this person's going to hell. This person's going to hell. And it just, it was eternity that just overwhelmed me. And I just started to weep and I started to cry out. And honestly, I think within a month, six weeks, they were saved. And there's key people. I think there's only, there's been one situation in in Nebraska that I've done that over and has still not come through. But every other circumstance in my life that I've travailed over and wept with a heart of, no, Lord, please, Lord, no, you can't, you can't let them go to hell. You can't let them... He's answered the cry. And I'm telling you, if it's a Holy Ghost prayer, if, if what you respond is the Holy Ghost, He will answer that. It doesn't matter what the devil says. It doesn't matter what the wicked do. At the moment, it might even look as if it'll never happen. I'm telling you, God keeps His word. Your part is not just to what we talked about this morning, about knowing exactly what we need to do, but it's keep going. Keep holding on, brother, sister. 
By the way, Paul travailed for fellow believers. Um, we find that in Galatians 4.19. This is where he said, My little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Isn't that powerful? He's praying for the believers. He's travailing like in birth for these believers that Christ would be formed in their life. Mm -hmm. That people would see Christ in them. That's powerful. So Paul applies this analogy of the travail of a woman who's going to birth a baby to the struggles and the toils of spiritual intercession. Can anybody relate to this, the, the travail, the pain that goes with, with praying for people? Yeah. I'm telling you, it is difficult. I'm, it, it's not easy. It's, a lot of the times the devil will just come to you and say, huh, huh, you think that's going to happen? You're, you're wasting your time. You're wasting your time. Sometimes it takes us to die before God answers a prayer. My dad prayed for years for me. I took my death. I took my dad's funeral to bring me to Jesus. Whatever it takes. My friend Davy, um, after my dad died, I mean, I came back to the Lord and Davy took me under his wing. He started to pour into me in the faith. And I said, Davy, did I wasted 10 years of my life here. Wasted 10 years just messing up, living for self. I says, did, did Dad ever talk about, about me and my rebellion? And like, I must have broke his heart. I, thinking I was the man living in the world. He said he always knew you were going to get saved. He always knew you were going to come through. And before he died, he confessed that on his deathbed to Davy. Even though I was out in that dirty, vile, stinking world. I'm telling you, the prayer, the tears matter. The travail matters. You can't whip that up. But I'm telling you what, whenever you see the people you're praying for, where they're going, where they're actually going if they don't get saved, there should be an urgency to your prayers. And not only for the unsaved, but also for believers. Paul is praying for believers and he's in travail. We know we don't always get immediate answers to prayer. But as we hold on, I believe that God does the work. Um, we learn a lot on this subject, actually, in Luke 18, verses 1 through 8. Okay, so it says here in verse 1, And he, Jesus, spoke a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Okay? That word faint in the Greek means to be afraid, to become discouraged, to become weary or tired or despair, to lose heart or to tire off. So men ought always to pray and not to faint. Jesus then backs that statement up, and I want you to hear me. He backs that statement up with a parable. And it's a parable you probably all heard about, the woman who was plaguing the head of the judge. So, but remember the context here, not fainting. So Jesus tells a story. There was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterwards he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard men, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith. And shall, now this is his conclusion here, and shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? Amen. Hallelujah. Brother, sister, do you get it? Though he bear long with them. And then he says, I tell you, 
that he will avenge them speedily. This should encourage you. See, I know people take out of this like manipulation. I can manipulate God. If I plague his head, then he's going to just stand to attention. But it's not talking about that. It's talking about persistence. It's talking about this subject that we're looking at this morning. Can you see it? Just not giving up. Keep on coming back. So those religious clowns that say to you, if, if you pray once, any more than once is lack of faith. They don't actually get what the Word of God says. The Bible says, ask and keep asking. Seek and keep seeking. Knock and keep knocking. Pray until. So as I come near a close here, Galatians 6, 9 says, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. If we faint not. Is there someone here this morning, maybe you're giving up, you're fainting, you're ready to throw in the towel. Well, I've prayed for that for so long and it just seems like God is not hearing me. Well, brother, sister, he is hearing you. He has got a time. He has got a way. He's, got, he's doing something that you can't see. But that doesn't mean that you should give up on that. As I come to a close, I want to just refer to the passage that we, we read this morning in Daniel. Especially verse 12. Of course, Daniel had been intensely praying, fasting and praying for 21 days. And it seemed like nothing was happening. But then the angel of the Lord came and told him a few truths. He said, fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you did set your heart to understand and to chasten yourself before your God, your words were heard. And I am come for your words. Isn't that lovely? From the first day, from the first moment you prayed, I was listening. I heard your prayer. And I have come now because of your words. But he explains, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. And I remained there with the kings of Persia. Here you have the two archangels taking on the demonic realm. Daniel was totally unaware of it. He's praying in the, in, down on planet earth. And in the invisible realm, there's a war going on. And I feel for us at the moment in this church, there's a war going on in the heavenlies. There's a war going on that we cannot even see. But I'm telling you, God wins. God wins that fight between darkness and light. We have to hold on to the promises of God. Yes, we do have our fainting fits. We have our moments. We all do. But I'm telling you that if God said something, then God's going to do something. God heard his cry. But unknown to, to Daniel, there was a battle going on that he couldn't see. Maybe there's a battle going on that you can't see. You're wondering why? What's happening here? Thank God Daniel kept going. I have wonderful news for you this morning. God has heard your cry the first day that you made it. Does Isaiah 65, 24 not say, And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer, and while they are yet speaking, I will hear? Charles Spurgeon once said this, If the Lord Jehovah makes us wait, let us do so with our whole hearts. For blessed are all they that wait for him. He is worth waiting for. This is what Spurgeon says. The waiting itself is beneficial to us. It tries faith, exercises patience, trains submission, and endears the blessing when it comes. The Lord's people have always been a waiting people. Today's battle will be part of tomorrow's testimony. If you keep going. 
you will be able to tell those around you that God kept his word. God fulfilled his word. But what does he expect of us? We keep going. We keep travailing. We keep persisting. We keep on keeping on until he does it. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. This subject touches the heart of every genuine believer this morning. Many of us are praying for things that have not been answered yet. Many of us are feeling the intensity of the battle this morning. Many of us can hear the screaming voice of the devil and the world mocking, scoffing, trying to tell us everything opposite to what God is actually telling us. But I urge you, I beg you this morning to hold on to the promises of God. Hold on to what he's prompted upon your spirit. In due time, he will answer that prayer. Father, we thank you for your truth this morning. Lord, we confess that as your people, we fall short on this issue. Lord, we give up so easy. We wobble so easy. We question so easy. We get discouraged so easy. We complain so easy. Lord, when we should keep our mouths shut with all that. Forgive us, O God, for our unbelief. Forgive us for our lack of patience, O God. Lord, you will do the right thing in the right way at the right time. So we hand our individual circumstances to you today. We hand our collective circumstances to you today. We hand every unsaved person that we have prayed for over the years into your hands. Lord, tonight, would you bring some of them into this meeting? Would you just give us a token, another token of your blessing, O God? Lord, we're asking in accord with your will, Lord. Lord, it is your will to save sinners. Lord, you have availed us this opportunity to preach the gospel to the lost tonight. Lord, you will keep your word. Lord, we don't know where, we don't know when, but we just ask that tonight would be a supernatural gathering where we would come expecting. Lord, give us, lay somebody upon our heart today that is ready to give up. Lord, bring them in, rescue them, Lord, from their dark, dark mess out there. Oh God, help us today to reach those around us, Lord, that aren't getting it. And just give us that strength to keep going in Jesus' name.